it's uh, my distinct pleasure to welcome to NC State uh, Dr. Mark Peters. Uh, Dr. Peters is the director of INL since 2015. Uh, prior to this, he had successful careers in uh, both Los Alamos initially and then out of National Lab. Uh, Mark earned his PhD in geophysical sciences from the University of Chicago. Uh, he is an expert on nu nuclear fuel cycles, waste management, uh, and he's frequently uh, asked to testify in, uh, in front of Congress in uh, D.C. He has many honors to his name. Uh, I uh, uh, include in here the ANS Fellow, which was in 2015 also. Right. Uh, and also he is a top level service and advising appointments in multiple uh, capacities across the country and internationally also. Uh, I'm sure you're here to keep Stop here and give uh, the floor to uh, Thanks, Yusuf. Welcome, Mark. Afternoon. How's everybody? Good. Uh, I'm going to try to stand here so I can sort of see the slides, if that's all right with everybody. Can you, it's good with you? Okay. Uh, wonderful to be here. Thanks for the kind of introduction. It's really great to be here at NC State. Uh, it, is my, it is my first visit. Uh, Couple, couple failed attempts, but we finally managed to, to, to get me here. So it's wonderful to, to spend time with you all. Uh, I, I'm going to, I have quite a few slides, and I'm, I'm going to go relatively fast through the slides. There's a lot of detail on the slides. Uh, they can certainly be available for you, for you after. Um, but I want to leave some time for questions. Uh, I am going to try to answer what is the future of nuclear energy, that question, from my perspective. I will uh, warn you, or perhaps maybe you'll be gleeful or not, that I, it, I, it will be decidedly optimistic. I'm an eternal optimist. And, and I, th I have a view that I think it's a pretty optimistic future. Yes, there's challenges. I'm not, I'm not uh, trying to ignore those. But, but I'm hoping when I get to discussion, maybe there will be some good give and take about, OK, okay you, 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 you uh, paint an optimistic view. So how optimistic is it really? And what are some of the challenges that we face? I'll talk about those as I go through. But I just want to warn you, it will be an optimistic view, because I actually do think there's a lot to be optimistic about. So I did want to start with national laboratories, because I, I realize NC State has a lot of deep partnerships with, with national labs in the Department of Energy system, uh, including INL. But I did want to spend just a little bit of time making sure everybody understood the, the DOE national lab system. There are 17 national labs in the Department of Energy system across the United States. Uh, we, are, we are one of those 17. With the exception of one, they are all contractors. So I'm not a federal employee. I'm a contractor. So I, uh, the, the lab is managed by a contract. I'll talk about the structure of the contract. And NC State actually has a key role in that contract. I'll talk about that in a moment. Uh, but we're arrayed right across the country. We're also arrayed right across the Department of Energy and the National Nuclear Security Administration. So three of the labs, Los Alamos, Livermore, and Sandia, for example, focus on the weapons, on, on maintaining the nuclear stockpile, stockpile stewardship, and the materials that go into the weapons. Uh, a lot of the other 10 of the labs are fundamental science labs that do basic science across the spectrum, physics, chemistry, uh, math, computer science. Uh, some, lives are, some labs like INL are focused more on the applied space, applied energy. Uh, we focus on nuclear energy, other aspects of clean energy, as well as national security. So, so lots of amazing capabilities, uh, a truly, truly uh, differentiated for the United States. Many countries across the world are really trying to have already or are trying to emulate the US national lab system. So it's a tremendous, tremendous system with tremendous resource. Um, a little bit about a history of INL. So INL started actually in 1943 during World War II as the Naval Proving Grounds. So the Navy used our site, which is 890 square miles west of Idaho Falls, to actually test battleship munitions. So they would make shells down in Pocatello, Idaho, south of Idaho Falls, bring them up to the site, and, and actually shoot them at targets out there on the site. Uh, after the war, many of the labs, I should have said in that previous, grew out of the Manhattan Project here in the United States. So you can really trace the history of the labs back to that. So at, after the war, there was a set of labs that were established to develop what I'll call civil nuclear energy technologies. That would be Argonne. That would be Oak Ridge. And they set up sites as well that included the National Reactor Testing Station that was, that was established in 1949 in Idaho. So that was the, the start. So, so just so you know, you'll probably see we're celebrating 70. Uh, Monday, February 18th, was the 70th anniversary of the National Reactor Testing Station. So we're spending this year celebrating that anniversary 
and and what what it brought to nuclear energy. So over the over time, the the the, the sort of tagline is 52 reactors. So over time, Argonne National Laboratory and other uh, industry and others tested 52 reactors on our site. So if you look at the reactor fleet in the U.S. and worldwide, you can really trace it back to something that was built, demonstrated, sometimes to failure on, on our site. So a lot of open space. There were reactors that they actually drove to, to, complete, to failure to test to see what would actually happen if a reactor failed. So an amazing history. There's books written on it. If, you're ever, if you ever can't sleep, I've got a great book about this thick that, 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 that really tells the entire history. It was established as a national lab in the 70s and, and, and grew through time. In 2005, the Department of Energy made the decision in conjunction with the Idaho congressional delegation that there was going to be a future for, for the lab in Idaho. So they established the Idaho National Laboratory and at that time designated it as the lead laboratory for nuclear energy research and development. Not to say we're the only lab that does that, but we have that leadership position. We work with the Office of Nuclear Energy and DOE for that. But we're really growing into a multi-purpose lab. Uh, we're not just nuclear energy. We do a lot of work in national security, particularly in the critical infrastructure area. I'll call out cybersecurity as a particular important focus. Um, we are an applied lab. And because of the ability to, to take advantage of the 890 square miles, we can really take problems to scale. So we operate our own grid. Um, we, we, we can actually uh, do, do testing of that grid for resilience, reliability, uh, against cyber attack, for example. We do a lot of work in the energy space, but being an applied lab, I like to say we take problems to scale. We do a lot of bench work, bench top research, but we also can take problems to scale into the field. So that's kind of the history of the place. The way the contract is structured, and this is, a, this is important to this, this, this audience, is it's managed by Battelle as a, as a consortium called Battelle Energy Alliance. And importantly, you can see the partners there. Battelle manages six national labs across the system, including Oak Ridge National Laboratory. So I'm actually a Battelle Energy Alliance employee, but I, I work for Battelle. Battelle Columbus, as do most at the laboratory. But important for this audience is a university consortium, and NC State has been a part of that consortium since 2005 and continues to be an important part of that consortium. So part of why I'm here is to continue to, to learn about NC State and also build the relationship and try to make this, consort, this partnership even more than it is, is today. So this is our 80 year history. Uh, y you know, many of you in this room know it. I've already sort of described it. And I'm going to talk a lot more about the future. Again, there's, there's lots of interesting stories about each one of these tests that have, that have taken place. We still operate four facilities, four, four critical facilities on the site, the advanced test reactor and an associated critical facility there. We just restarted the transient test reactor about a year, a little over a year ago. And, 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 and we also operate a small neutron radiography machine in our materials and fuels complex. And I'll talk about the promise of what we hope is a new fast test reactor. I'll talk about that. NC State has, has an ongoing and future role in designing and hopefully ultimately constructing that machine as well. Um, quickly on, on sort of the nuclear value proposition. This, this is a slide from Nuclear Energy Institute. Institute, they're the trade organization for the nuclear industry, so it's inherently sort of, it's, it's a pitch, right? It's, it's the value of nuclear energy. But it, it's, it's, it's unarguable that nuclear energy produces a large percentage of the clean energy in the U.S. energy mix and worldwide. Doesn't emit greenhouse gases. Life cycle, yeah, if you, if you include life cycle, including uranium and mining, sure, there's some emissions. But if you look at the emissions from, from nuclear, it's comparable to what you would get from solar hydro and wind. So it's a big contributor to the clean energy system. Um, we know it doesn't emit SOX NOx. Um, it produces a lot of jobs. They, once, you, once you build a plant, yes, we're having a hard time bringing p new plants online on schedule, uh, ahead of schedule and under budget. We're certainly having those challenges. But once they get online, they operate with high capacity factors. Uh, and, the, and they operate very affordably in terms of generation costs. I'll talk about some of the economic challenges as I, as I go through. But the bottom line is it's an important part of our current energy mix in the U.S. and many countries across the world as well. One of the interesting things is, and I want to I talk about this slide for, for, for a bit, is why nuclear in particular go forward. Um, it's reliable. It's resilient. Arguably, once it's online, it's affordable. Uh, the, the, the big challenge with nuclear is high upfront capital costs during the design and construction phase. 
But the interesting thing is, is and I'm going to talk about it throughout, is the emerging bipartisan consensus in the United States that nuclear is an important part of our future mix. And why do Republicans and Democrats come together and think that? They think about it because of the national security implications of not having a nuclear industry in a nuclear sector, but they also think about it in terms of its role in helping to mitigate, mitigate climate change, minimize greenhouse gas emissions. And I put up all these logos for a reason, because these are a lot of, most of these are uh, sort of center to left-leaning environmental groups with a few right-leaning groups. But I put it up there because all of them are, are different parts of a conversation about the value of nuclear, and in particular, the value of nuclear as we think about a clean energy system go forward. Uh, we, could have an, I could, we could have an entire talk on the different views of all of these, of all these organizations. Some have come out quite, quite strongly in favor of it. Environmental Progress, Michael, Michael Schellenberger, who people probably read from in here, he used to be Sierra Club, very, very vocal. Uh, the Union of Concerned Scientists, always been very vocal uh, about the safety of nuclear power have come out and, and, and very strongly and stated that we need to be careful about premature retirements of the existing fleet because of the impact on carbon emissions in the United States, increasing carbon emissions in the United States. Um, the Nature Conservancy is now looking at scenarios that include nuclear. Uh, NRDC and Sierra Club, not so much. Um, they, 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 they've, they've not, as, as organizations, come out strongly in public, but there's active discussions behind the scenes about if we're serious about mitigating climate change, we really need to be talking about nuclear, nuclear energy go forward. Um, and some of the other organizations are much more sort of pro-nuclear. Uh, organizations like Third Way in, in, in Washington, D.C. are really, really driving that conversation, particularly with the Democrats in Congress, about the importance and the value of nuclear energy. So the point being, there's a conversation. It's a different conversation than I would argue was even in place five years ago about nuclear energy. So it's really changing the landscape. Uh, about how we think about it. And this is part of why I have a level of optimism, uh, a big part of why I have a level of optimism. But there's the cost challenge. So this, there's a lot of information here. This is levelized cost of electricity. There's a lot of uh, you all in this room, or many of you are aficionados on this, so you know there's lots of different ways to think about economics in the energy space. This is one way of thinking about it. This is from Lazard. Uh, it's a compilation of levelized cost of electricity for a wide range of energy technologies. This, so, so notice in yellow there at the bottom, this is new nuclear. So generation costs for existing nuclear down in the 30s, sort of 30, 40, 50 megawatt, I, I, think, I think in megawatt hours, so 30, 40, 50 dollars. But new nuclear coming online is quite expensive, and if you, if you don't put a price on carbon, it's hard to compete with renewables, for example, wind, solar. It's hard to compete with natural gas. So the downward pressure... The, the, the pressure that's being produced on existing nuclear with the, the, the market structure maybe not in the southeast, but in other parts of the country, as well as the cost of natural gas has really put tremendous pressure on the existing fleet in the United States. So we, part of this is the motivation for putting this up is also to think the research and development that has to go into the next generation really has to be thinking about the areas where we can drive down cost. We have to be thinking about driving down cost. The recent MIT report made the very important point that a lot of the cost isn't in the cool stuff. We all, many of us like to think about about the core, the design of the, uh, the, the reactor design itself, but a lot of the cost is in the civil construction, the amount of concrete and the amount of other, uh, that, that aspect of it. The balance of plant really drives the cost. So we as a community, universities, labs, need to be thinking about how to, how to do the research that will help solve some of these economic challenges. Then there's always the spent fuel challenge, right? I, I, call, I, I like to call nuclear energy clean, but when I get in the room with certain environmental groups, they say it's not clean, you have a bunch of nuclear waste. So we have to, you know, it's being stored safely and securely across. This is, this is a U.S.-centric view. Um, we, of course, don't reprocess in the U.S., so it's destined for geologic disposal somewhere deep in geology. By the way, you may have picked up geophysics in my background. The way I got into this world was through Yucca Mountain. So I worked at Yucca Mountain for 10 years. So ask me questions about that, and we could be here all night. Um, but there, the policy path is to bury, bur you know, bury our spent fuel and nuclear waste in deep geology. This is not a technical issue. At this point, is a social, social challenge, and it's also a policy issue. Um, but the bottom line is we've got it spread over multiple sites in multiple states. It's not a lot. You all have probably seen this. If you put it all in a football field, it basically fills up a football field. We wouldn't pack it this way. 
But it's you, right because you better spread it out a little bit, or else we, well, the criticality folks in the room would be, tell me how what bad things would happen. Correct? Uh, but but um, but the point is, it's not it's not a lot. You know, we 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 have a solution that is deep geologic disposal if we choose not to reprocess. But it's a policy issue that has to be addressed. It's being safely stored interim storage, but not, not a sustainable solution. So to me, there's a formal state, formal, formal uh, sort of parlance in NRC space called waste confidence. If you're going to extend the life of a plant or build a new plant, you have to convince the Nuclear Regulatory Commission that you have confidence that there's a disposition path for the, nuclear, for the spent fuel that's being generated. And right now, they're, they're relying on interim storage, which is safe for decades, but not the sustainable long-term solution. And I think we can all agree on that. So we've got to deal with this issue. If we could get back on a policy path, I think there is technical solutions. I mentioned the national security implications. So, so and, and there's a lot up here, but the, the fundamental point I want to make is this is now a US, sort of a US-centric view. If you think about the national security ap aspects of this, the fact that the United States was really a, a, a big contributor to the birth, the birth of commercial, commercial nuclear energy technologies. That then precipitated a large supply and value chain that was based in the U.S. Because we've stopped, to build plant, stopped building plants in the United States, that supply and value chain has really atrophied quite a bit. So we don't have a large industrial base. Uh, as you know, uh, you know, Westinghouse is, we call U, Westinghouse a U.S. company. It's owned by a Canadian company, um, GE's uh, Hitachi. So, so, so Really, from the U.S. perspective, we've lost a lot of that, comp that competitive edge. And so when you talk in Washington about that, that's what gets folks interested and worried and motivated to try to think about, let's make sure there's a future for nuclear energy. So there's climate change, but then there's also the national security implications of losing that leadership position. That's a very U.S.-centric perspective. But if we want to be a partner in the globe, because nuclear energy is going to happen across the globe whether we build in the U.S. or not. Right? Other countries are building currently, uh, and, and, and other, other countries are thinking about building uh, new nuclear. So if we're serious as a country about being a part of that conversation, then we need to, be, we need to get back in the game, quite frankly, as, 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 a, as a nation. And I think that's getting people's attention. Just to make the point about plants being constructed across the world, and you all think very well know this, uh, lots of construction in China. Uh, Russia, South Korea, and of course Russia, China, and South Korea are doing a lot of effort to export their technology to other countries. For example, the, the UAE is building South Korean designs. Uh, the Saudi, Saudi, Saudi is thinking about building new nuclear, and they're still in the process of deciding who they're going to partner with. Uh, but Russia, China, and others will be playing there. The U.S. hopes to play. We'll, we'll, see, we'll see if that's the case. Um, but, but it's also not only the developed world, but it's the developing world that's thinking about new nuclear. Again, it's partly a conversation. It's about energy, a, a, a nation's making decisions related to energy security for their own nation, as well as climate change. And, and, and nuclear always comes back into the mix uh, when, you start to ha when you start to have those conversations. So the existing fleet in the US, uh, this is just showing that, showing that the, the reactors that are located across the United States, I've already made many of these points. They operate at high capacity factors. Um, I've already touched on the premature retirements. We call them premature. They're, they're, they're having to retire plants prior to their, the extension, prior to the expiration of their licenses with the NRC. There's multiple plants that are under actual pressure that are threatening to close as well. Um, and again, that's because of uh, a lot because of natural gas, cheap natural gas, as well as mar structure of the electricity markets. And how we va whether we value, we don't have a price on carbon in the United States. That, that hurts things like nuclear. That hurts renewables. Um, and, and also, there's also the ongoing dialogue. How do you price reliability and, resi and resilience in the grid? Is, it, is that something, how do you value that? How do you, and so that's an active conversation with, uh, with, with Congress, with the administration, and with FERC, with the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, and all of the regional transmission organizations are actively talking about how do you price reliability and resilience. If you put a reasonable price on reliability and resilience, nuclear would, again, would help the economic case for nuclear energy as well. But when you think about new nuclear, a utility that's thinking about building new, they need new, tr new, 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 uh, d new generation. It's hard to beat natural gas for big generation in this day and age. And so that, that's a real challenge for, uh, for nuclear power currently. Um, so, but 
in, in, with the interest of that, what are some of the things that labs and universities bring to the table that can help uh, sustain the existing fleet? Uh, and the, these are programs, folks at NC State are involved in these programs, folks at the labs, INL, Oak Ridge, and, and Argonne in particular. The whole idea of the Light Water Reactor Sustainability Program that the Department of Energy has funded for several years is, is, is in here. I'm not going to go through all these details, but there's many aspects. Uh, this is sort of an INL view of the world, but there's many aspects of what, what, what are being brought to the table. And again, there's, there's, this isn't just INL work. This is across universities and laboratories uh, looking at understanding the, the energy system and the markets to inform policy discussions. Uh, risk and development of risk informed tools. There's folks in this room who are thinking a lot about about that. I'll talk a bit more about integrated energy systems testing. Many call it hybrid energy systems. We're very active in that area as well. Uh, the whole challenge of extending the license of the existing reactors, the materials challenges, the the the, the INC challenges, uh, et cetera, et cetera, and the research, the applied research that has to go into that, and then finally the collaborations between industry the labs and universities in developing accident tolerant fuels. Um, so all those things are active investments by the federal government and the private sector into all leading to what we hope is sustaining the existing fleet go forward. So as you all know, in this room, there's a continuum of innovations associated with nuclear reactor technologies. You've got the existing light water reactor, PWR, uh, pressurized water reactors, boiling water reactor technology. Um, the evolutionary change in what is uh, the small modular reactors, in particular the light water space, the new scale design, and I'll talk more about that. We have a very active role at the laboratory with new scale, trying to be a part, an important partner with them for their, for their first of a kind build in the United States. But then also what's, exciting, what's also exciting to me is the, uh, the so it's a little bit of back to the future, right? We've built molten salt reactors in this country. We've built uh, sodium fast reactors in this country. Uh, but there's a, there's a, um, there's an expansion of the number of private sector players in the advanced reactor space beyond, beyond say, say a, a, a light water SMR that are very interesting to me. I, will they all be successful? No, but it's created a really interesting sort of startup ecosystem that I'm going to talk about in the nuclear area that's very interesting. I think it's innovation. I think it's actually an opportunity for the United States to leapfrog back into, back, back into a leadership position. Not to say that other countries aren't looking at these concepts. They are. And we need to be partnering with them. But there's a lot of, a lot of interesting ideas coming out of, I will say, all, especially the US universities. You're getting a lot of interesting innovation out of the US in, 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 universities and a lot of interesting reactor companies that are, that, are, that are emerging from those activities. So first on integrated energy systems, one of the, uh, people call it hybrid energy systems. But we're thinking a lot about, along with uh, long, actually collaborating very closely with the National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Golden, Colorado, because they're renewables. They're, they, they lead with renewables. We lead with nuclear. So it's a natural combination to think about. I say often that the future energy system is going to be a lot of nuclear and a lot of renewables if we want reliable, resilient, clean. That's my opinion. Um, so in order to think about that, there's research questions that you, one has to address. What does that system look like? How coupled is the system? How do you think about producing not only electrons for electricity, but also pro use, use of process heat for producer of products like hydrogen, for example? How does that integrate with an electrification of the transportation system? Um, I, should say, I should have said at the beginning, when you talk about deep decarbonization of, of, of the economy, it can't just be the electricity sector. I would put to you that decarbonizing the electricity sector is hard, but it's easy, the easiest part of it. It's how do you decarbonize the, the, the transportation sector, and then even harder, the manufacturing industrial se other industrial sectors. So, so we have to really think about how the energy system, a clean energy system, will, will uh, let's say, penetrate all of those markets. So if you think about a 2050 energy system, to me, it's going to look a lot different than the energy system does today. So what is the role of nuclear in that? Um, we at INL, this is a picture of one of our labs. It's the Energy Systems Lab in our research and education campus in Idaho Falls. We're actually, with the support of the Department of Energy, uh, both nuclear energy as well as the Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy Office, putting together effectively a pilot of that integrated energy system. So we're working with other labs, with universities, with utilities to actually put together a test bed to think about, OK, let's test what that integrated energy system might look like go forward. This connects also to the large 110 miles of grid that we operate at our site. 
so we can do a lot of real-time digital simulation between us, between, our, between this lab, between the site, with other labs, with universities, to understand what this integrated energy system might look like. This is an emerging research agenda, I would say. Uh, DOE is going to be investing more and more in this. And when you bring utilities in and, and start showing this, this is an area where utilities can come in and sort of do what ifs. And runs, as they're doing IRPs, as they're planning their resources for 2025 and beyond, how do I think about the mix of nuclear and renewables? How do I think about electrification being a part of that? How do I think about production of hydrogen? How do I think about biomass production? How do I think about all that? So we can address these problems at scale with some of our facilities. So transitioning to advanced reactors. Um, this is very aspirational, I'll tell you that. This is an INL view of, of, of what, what is in the art of the possible for advanced reactors. So a so, um, couple, th couple things to paint the landscape for you. One of the interesting things that's happened in the last year is it's a little bit another one of these back to the future things. The Department of Defense in the US has come back around to thinking about nuclear energy as a part of their energy mix for forward operating areas for military installations, and for other applications. And they would be thinking about, you hear, you're starting to hear very small or micro reactors, sort of 2 to 20 megawatt range. Uh, there was just a couple Fridays ago, it's now been closer to a month, there was a request for information released by the Department of Defense to start three to four industry partnerships with the Department of Defense to explore demonstration and ultimate, ultimate deployment of micro reactors in the DOD ecosystem within the next uh, five, six, seven years. So if the US DOD bring, comes to the table, they bring urgency and they bring a lot of resources. So that's really causing, uh, creating a lot of, uh, I'll call it buzz in the community. A lot of companies are positioning themselves to think about, could I be that micro reactor? There's multiple companies out there that have very, very small reactor designs that they've been developing and marketing. Um, our role at INL would be not only to work with them to help them innovate, but also there's, there's likely going to be an opportunity for the Department of Defense is actually talking to us about, well, we're going to need a place to demonstrate the first of a kinds. And I talked to you about our history. Uh, that's, well, we built 52, so why not 53, right? So, so, so we're actively talking with them. If they do get serious about this, could we be the demonstration site for, for say, a company or two that, wants, that the Department of Defense would like to explore these reactors? If they're serious, the DOD could be first, sort of first deployment, first of a kind movers, but the Canadians, for example, are very, very active in, in the small modular reactor space and in the very small systems. And that's because of the, a lot of need for remote power. You go to some of these remote communities in Canada and Alaska as well, uh, but let's take Canada. They're, they're sub, the government is subsidizing diesel for generators in these, in these communities. So. T t suffice it to say, nuclear gets real economic if you're competing against diesel that's been flown in by, by, by plane. So you could see actually first deployment of some of these in, in remote Canada, and, and the Canadians see this. It's a national priority for the Canadians as well. So microreactors is really, again, the Army and others had, talked, had thought about this before. This isn't new, but it's back. And so that's causing a lot of interesting momentum within the community. I mentioned New Scale. So New Scale is a company, actually a spin out of Oregon State University. Um, Jose Reyes was a professor at Oregon State, now the CTO of New Scale Power. Uh, they're based out of Corvallis uh, still to this day. They have a light water, a uh, small modular reactor concept that's going through design certification with the N Nuclear Regulatory Commission as we speak. And they've, 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 they've converged on our site, working with a utility consortium in the West to be where they'll build their first of a kind. So we've got a site picked out on INL that we're hoping by 2026 there will be a small modular reactor built in the US. Now, a lot of their ultimate deployment probably could very well be internationally. Um, they could build quite a bit here, but they'll build a lot, they'll, they'll probably do a lot of export. Um, but but we, are, we are doing everything we can. To me, to me that, that really needs to be successful. They've benefited from a lot of government, federal government investment uh, so in order for, for a lot of what I'm saying to come true, you really need to see new scale. We, I want to see Vogel 3 and 4 successful, absolutely, but you really need to see new scale successful to justify the federal investment and show that we can actually do this. Um, uh, I, I mentioned already about the versatile test reactor. Uh, 
this is probably a good place to talk about the legislation. There was, there's been bipartisan legislation that's been signed into law by the president. One, one law in September, another one a couple weeks ago. The first one was the Nuclear en Energy Innovation Capabilities Act. And, and it, it did a lot of things, including it authorized the construction of a versatile fast test reactor in the United States. Or the design, excuse me, not the construction, the design. But they, it, it said we want a versatile test reactor in the United States for fast test, neutron testing capability by 2026. Very aggressive time frame. Um, it also authorized th other things that I'll talk about. The other thing that was signed into law is called the NEMA, the Nuclear Energy Innovation Modernization Act. And that goes after the, let's call it the reform of the licensing process at the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission. How they recover fees, how they do risk-based risk uh, risk-informed performance-based regulation, and, and other things that are important to the future of the nuclear industry. So we're at the, I'll talk more about VTR. And then the idea of let's think about uh, advanced systems with non-light water coolants, molten salt systems, high temperature gas systems. Uh, there, there, there is starting to be growing discussions in Washington. And, and I should also say that this requires a lot of government investment. So will all this happen? But to me, if, if at least most of it happens, we're on, on the right path. Uh, but it's going to require significant government. But there's active discussions about sh we, we probably need to get on the path of starting to demonstrate some of these technologies. Because the question always becomes, a lot of the companies that, that, I'm, gonna, that I'm referring to and that, I, that I'll show some logos, they're, 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 they're early stage. So they have designs. They haven't built anything. So we really need to get in the business of demonstrating something to show that, it, that, that they can work the way they do and more importantly understand the economics. So a little bit more on micros. I've already talked about that a bit but I did want to put this up just to give you a sense of the number of companies that are currently thinking about micro reactor designs. A lot of companies, companies that I'm sure NC State has relationships with We've established relationships with the majority of these companies. Other labs, Oak Ridge has, has, has relationships. Um, we're trying very hard to, the labs as a system are trying very hard to partner with these, these companies to, to help them be successful because it's really important to the future, future of nuclear. So, you know, and they, all, all kinds of different concepts. Uh, Oklo is a sodium fast system. Uh, GA has a high temperature gas system in the fast spectrum. Uh, this, is, this, is a, this is also a sodium system. Um, so there's different kinds of concepts that are out there from these companies. Some, large, some, some of these you, you would recognize as quite large companies. Other are, are quite frankly startups. I've already talked about the SMR, uh, so I won't dwell on it. What they're planning to deploy on the INL site is a 12 pack, so the 12 modules. Um, uh, what I should talk about is what is part of the value proposition for siting at INL. We provide a site. It's well characterized. Um, but there's also discussions with them about using the first module that we would buy, the lab would buy power from the first module. Because if you look at our desert facilities, we're about 60 megawatts uh, of electricity required, and that's about the size of a module. So if we buy power from the first module, that, that helps with our business case. And then we've also, Shannon Bragg Sitton, who some in this room know, has been leading an effort to um, basically use the second module for research. So the idea, they build the second module, the government leases it back, and then the labs and universities use that for research in microgrids, testing of sensors and materials, um, understanding en integrated energy systems and how, a nu how nuclear fits into it, and other kinds of testing. So we have an execution plan that's been developed. These are all part of the business model that the utility consortium is using to um, to hopefully make the case to, the, to, their, to their partners that it's economic to go build nuclear. If, if, the, if the CEO of the utility consortium, it's called UAMPS, Utah Associated Municipal Power Systems, it's a bunch of municipal utilities, small municipal utilities across the Mountain West. If he was here, he'd tell you he, he hasn't made the decision yet. He's close. He's thinking about, do I build natural gas or do I build nuclear? That's his decision because he's got aging coal that's going to go away. And, but he, he would tell you that he's hedging that there's going to be a price on carbon. So he thinks that he, if he's smart, he's going to build nuclear because eventually there's going to be a price on carbon and then I'm, I'm golden. So that's the conversation that he's having with his, with his uh, shareholders. What is the other part of the government role? 
Uh, people know HALU. It's a word that's flying around now. High assay, low enriched uranium. You'll start to hear that more and more and more. A lot of these advanced reactor companies want to push the enrichments of their fuel up as close to 20% as possible. So that's HALU, high SALEU. So it's above 5%. It's 19.5 to 19.9% enrichment. Uh, this could be an important role for the government. The government owns large stockpiles of high enriched uranium, either existing as HEU or we've got R2 that is being processed that could generate uh, HALU. Uh, there's, the department has now announced the intent to restart in domestic enrichment using Centris technology, USEC and now Centris technology at Pike, in Piketon, Ohio. So there's lots of different paths. You could treat Navy fuel. You could actually reprocess Navy fuel and recover HEU, downblend that to make HALU. But important, co the, the, the companies that I, that I mentioned are looking to the government to provide that material. So the first few cores of a lot of these a lot of these reactors that I'm talking about probably are fueled by government-supplied uh, high SA, low enriched uranium. So we are working actively, the labs are working actively with these companies through the Department of Energy to think about, okay, how do we supply that material? So if I tell you there's going to be a micro-reactor by the early 20s, we're going to have to generate HALU for a startup core by early 20s. That, that's, a, that's a stretch. Uh, but we're actively working on plans to try to make that happen. But there isn't really, all those companies are all saying they need these higher, higher enrichments, um, almost to the company. So what, what is the government doing and what are the labs doing? Um, during the Obama administration, this goes back to, this is driven by the discussion on climate change. There was, a, there was a couple White House summits. I was fortunate enough to be invited to both of them. But I got to the lab in October of 15 and there was a White House summit a month after I arrived. And it was about the role of nuclear in mitigating climate change. And what came out of that was GAIN, the Gateway for Accelerated Innovation in Nuclear. Many know it by Rita Barronwall. Rita's the face of GAIN. Rita, we hope, is anyone, the head of Office of Nuclear Energy. It'd be nice if it was yesterday. It's not yet, but it'll be soon, I hope. Um, but what it was, was it, it was really an attempt to think about, okay, if we're going to really innovate and deploy nuclear in time to address climate change, We've got to really accelerate the way we innovate, and the labs have to do a much better job of working in partnership with industry. So that's what GAIN really is. It's a partnership with not only these three labs, but multiple labs to try to improve the way the labs provide our capability further and accelerate the innovation that's going on, particularly in the advanced reactor community. Some of the, some of the existing, existing nuclear reactor fleet vendors and utilities are starting to take advantage of some of these resources as well, but it was originally intended sort of imagined to be really supporting the advanced reactor community and the associated supply and value chain. Two components. It had a test bed component, so things like experimental capability, modeling and simulation capability, ability to develop fuels, qualify fuels. I put TerraPower up here because they're, they're a unique circumstance, right? They have a very wealthy man who's on their board, Bill Gates. Uh, but we were, do, we're doing a lot of funds in work for TerraPower where they're funding to help develop their fuel. Uh, for their for their traveling wave reactor, um, bringing the bear all the government funded capabilities that are at the labs in in SUF uh, to to help to help further industry's needs. And then I've already sort of talked about this: the ability to then take that to government sites like labs, who can provide the infrastructure, the licensing support, and just the real estate to be able to demonstrate their technologies. Um, so this was really sort of the way gain started. But one of the things that was missing from this test bed was this fast spectrum test reactor. That's get back, that gets back to the versatile test reactor. This was the beginning. This was a slide we constructed four years ago. This is sort of was an important part of motivating that, that Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act that then noted that we needed to fill that uh, fast test uh, reactor gap in the United States. The test bed, this is a very INL centric. HIFR could be included here. NSU, I'll talk about NSUF in a minute. But HIFR at Oak Ridge is included in it. We've got ATR, TREAT, the, the, the nuclear radio, NRAD at MFC, and then we hope a versatile test reactor. Um, but to, if y'all don't know INL, the research campus is in Idaho Falls, but this is 890 square miles. It's big. A lot of space. Rhode Island. It's, it's about that size, so it's big. Um, so you can do a lot of things out there, and we have. 
Um, but there's a lot of opportunities for the country to take advantage of that real estate. Uh, the test reactor, I, I put this up in specific because I, uh, there's already a role that NC State's playing, and, uh, and I know I think there's going to be opportunities for NC State to play even a deeper role. Um, there's, this is a lot of uh, sort of project management ease and DOE speak, so sorry for that. But it just gives you a sense, in order to get from now to 2026 to an operating versatile test reactor, it's going to require uh, substantial resources, and it's an aggressive time frame, but we've got a project management schedule that gets us there. Assuming resources are provided, we think we can go. We're using as much as we can existing technology. It's going to be a sodium fast reactor. We've built those. Likely to be metal fueled, we've built those. It's EBR, EBR1, EBR2, we're both metal fueled, sodium cooled fast reactors. So we've done this before. Um, but we'll, you know, it'll be the 21st century version of that. So, but it's a wonderful opportunity to bring the, universe, the labs, universities, and industry together to build something new and also fill an important testing gap for, for, for this. We signed a contract with GE Hitachi and Bechtel to come in and help us mature the design. Uh, so so it, is getting, it is getting legs, and so we're very excited about it. We're going to get approval for basically approval to proceed to design from DOE, we hope, any day uh, if, if all goes well. So what about the underlying science that has to be done? Um, it's advanced modeling and simulation. I know there's a lot of folks in this room who, 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 who contribute here. Um, our contribution is, is, the, is the suite of codes that are moose, marmot, bison. I like to call them moose in the herd. But it's, it's, it's the software suite that we've developed. Uh, of course, Castle is a really, really important part of this. The Nuclear Energy Advanced Modeling and Simulation Program, NEMS, we call it. Uh, as Castle winds down, I'm actually working with DOE and my leadership, as well as with Oak Ridge, to hopefully motivate, uh, as Castle winds down, motivate a bigger NEMS program. So what's the next program? You, you can't just have Castle go away and not do anything. Um, and I'm sure I get a lot of agreement in this room on that. Um, so we need to think about what's that, what's that Mod Sim 2020 program. And so we're actively thinking about that. So, but, but modeling and simulation really is going to transform the way we design design and deploy nuclear energy systems. I, I, I think a lot about fuel and fuel qualification and what, what impacts you, you could have in terms, of, in terms of accelerating fuel qualification if you really brought validated modeling and simulation modeling tools to the table. And the NRC accepted them. Uh, that would be a huge, huge transformation for the industry. So an important part, many labs and universities contribute to this. This is just our contribution. We, we're a trailing edge lab in terms of compute power. We're building a new building out in our research campus. We'll, we'll upgrade. We're operating a machine now that's running about five petaflops, and we'll upgrade to about a 10 petaflop machine. So we're trailing edge in the lab sense. We take advantage of Oak Ridge resource quite a bit in the HPC space, uh, a bit, bit at Argonne, but a lot at Oak Ridge uh, through, in collaboration with them. Uh, NSUF, I think, has been really, really an important part, important part of what the Department of Energy has brought to the table. So it's, 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 the, it's the virtual set of facilities across the system. NC State, of course, is an important partner in that. Um, but it's really, I, th I think it's done a really a terrific job. Uh, there's limitations with everything, but I think it's done a terrific job of really investing in the broader infrastructure across, across the labs and the universities in the United States. Because it's really, you know, right? I mean, we have to have the facilities and capabilities to bring you all students in here, get you excited about what you're doing, because you're the future. So NSUF's very, been a very important part of the investment. Another thing that the Nuclear Energy Innovation Capabilities Act did was establish the National Reactor Innovation Center. And that's really that demonstration platform. Where is the place in the government sites in the US where companies can go to demonstrate their technologies? It designated this. It did designate it at INL, so I'm being a middle, little misleading with the title. Um, but we view uh, INL as an important part of that contribution. So I think you're going to be hearing more here pretty, pretty soon, actually, about INL's role in helping enable what, what, the, what the law calls the National Reactor Innovation Center. Um, I did want to put up uh, just a little bit about uh, the, the, the collaboration with NC State and the laboratory. Um, a, lot, a lot of information on the right and some some pretty high-level areas that we're co uh, cooperating in and collaborating in. 
Um, met, many in this room are a part of those cooperations. Some of them heard me earlier today say, I want these to, I, I think we need to take the next step. We need to have a much grander partnership between NC State and INL. And these are some of the areas I've spent enough time today to know that there's a lot more opportunity that we haven't tapped yet between the two institutions. But it's not just nuclear, it's in the biological biomass area, cyber wireless area. Uh, that's, that's another area that I think we can explore as well. So that's why I'm here, is to learn and try to carry that back. Um, next generation is absolutely key. I can talk about this all I want, but if there isn't a next generation, uh, then we're not going to have, we're not going to really have the future that, I, that I'm trying to articulate. Um, and now I have a series of slides just to, just to, so the one I forgot to put in, in this is now the INL advertisement part. So if you want to do an internship, I think an internship at a national laboratory is awesome. I said national laboratory, not just INL. If you get an opportunity to do an internship at National Lab, I would, I would, I would encourage you. It can, be, it can be undergrad, grad. Undergrad, I know, is a little easier because when you're in grad, you're already in, in your thesis and stuff, but I'll get to that in a second. Um, but I encourage you to do it. We have a program. Uh, if you're interested in nuclear and national security, look at INL. Uh, we bring in about three, 350 interns a summer. Uh, all the labs have that, so I'd encourage you to look. Uh, we also just started recently a graduate fellowship program where we partner with the universities to actually help fund graduate fellowships. Um, and, and so this has really just started. Uh, there's, there's one. How, how many from here? One? There's, there's three. There's, okay, there's three. I, I know there's, there's one. So there's three from NC State already. So the idea being that it's, it's mentorship by both INL staff as well as, of course, university faculty. Um, you're working for, you're, you have a, a lead, an advisor here at the university, but you're cooperating, collaborating with staff at the laboratory. We help share, share the cost for tuition and research costs. I um, already heard it in a conversation earlier, we can probably tweak this to make it even better and we'll work on that. But this was something that we, really we just started uh, within the, like, with, like last year. Uh, and it's already paying dividends. But the universities that are close partners in the contract are the ones that are taking the most advantage of it. So I would imagine three getting, I would hope three would grow uh, over, over time. So for those of you who are undergrads, maybe think about this. Or if you're, you, maybe if you're early in your grad program, think about this. Um, postdocs, for those of you who are going to ultimately graduate, everybody's going to graduate, right? Yeah. Are you sleeping? No. Nah. <laughs> so, so we also have a growing, an, an, I'll also put in a plug for postdocs. So, and again, this is not, a, not just an INL plug. If you're interested in a postdoc, go to a lab is a really cool place to do a postdoc, any lab. Um, we're growing our postdoc program. We have a name postdoc, uh, a set of name postdocs that we've established. And this is really an idea that comes from the science labs like Oak Ridge, Argonne, and as well as the weapons labs like Los Alamos. They've had long-standing name postdoc programs. So we picked some of our distinguished scientists or folks who we admire, like Lynn Seaborg, and we, we've put together name postdocs. We also have what I'll characterize as general postdocs. So we're, we're, we're up to almost, we're in the 40s. We're almost up to 50 postdocs, and I want to continue to grow that program. So if you're looking for postdoc opportunities in the labs, look at, look at INL as well. And then finally, joint faculty. Um, uh, we, have, we have a couple joint appointments uh, between the laboratory and NC State. This is a perspective from the lab. What's in it for the lab? There's a value proposition. There's the what's in it for the university and what's in it for the lab. But I think fundamentally, from the lab's perspective, it, 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 it brings in more creative thinking, creativity. Bring that creativity and innovation. It provides us more, more opportunities to interact and access students, uh, undergrads and grad students. Um, it just increases our impact. It broadens our reach. It increases our impact. Um, and, and, and I'd like to see more of our folks doing joint appointments at universities as well. But as I've said to m multiple people today, it also allows us to attract a different kind of person. There's a lot of people who, who are interested in labs but still want to have that tie to that university. So you, you can really attract a different kind uh, of, of individual, I think, and I think it's all good. Many labs have deep partnerships with universities and joint appointments. So I'd like to see that become more vibrant at INL as well. And this is my wrap up, and then I will stop. Uh, this was intended to sort of 
lay out things that need to happen. And now I'm going back to what, what's the future and why I think it's optimistic. Lots has to happen. I, th I personally have a, the opinion that if we put a price on carbon, that really changes the conversation. And it's also the right thing to do to put a price on carbon, in my opinion, from a policy perspective. But I don't make policy. I just, I just get to talk to them. Um, but I think that would help enable demand in things like nuclear renewables and, uh, and other areas. And also drive fossil to have to clean up, right? Go to carbon capture, sequestration, and other technology improvements. I've alluded a little bit to the licensing process in the U.S., continuing to try to still, still, still license safe systems, but streamline that process is a long pull in the tent to get things to deployment, the NRC process. And so, and I know they know that, so they're committed to trying to do that. Reestablishing the supply and value chain, but this is really a global thing, right? I, it can't just be the U.S. We really need to think about how the U.S. fits into a global nuclear energy ecosystem. It really is a global, global expansion that's going to be occurring. And then finally, how, uh, you know, I talked about industry, but how does industry and government work together? There's the new scale, is, is one way to do it. The, the, the government has put in tremendous amount of resource into, into new scale to try to get it to completion, to, de, to first deployment. But if I talk about advanced reactors and demonstrating multiple advanced reactors, what's the role of the private sector and the government in terms of who owns the risk, who pays for it, who pay, how, much, how much money comes from each source? Those are all questions that aren't really being addressed and need to be addressed in order to realize that future. And I think that would be it. So thank you. So fire away. Questions for Mark. Let's start with the students. How do you advise students and recent graduates to get into the office, into public offices for advising or policymaking? So how, how, to, how to be able to work for a policymaker? Yeah. Uh, they they hire interns into all the offices, the congressional offices, at all levels. So I would encourage you. I mean, you can look at fellowships like AAAS, ANS. ANS has one, but AAAS has multiple fellows where you can apply, and they'll place you in an office. Congressional, congressional office, sorry. So I'm talking on the federal level. Yeah. Um, but then you, you can also, just through connections, you could go, you know, you could come to me, and I could connect you with a government affairs person who could put who could help you make connections in an office. <laughs> but I also encourage you to talk up through your department because you have a government affairs. You have people. In, NC State has people in Washington, who who whether you know it or not, who wander around and talk say great things about NC State. Uh, but no, that's the best way to do it. I, I will tell you that I spend a lot of time in congressional offices. No surprise, and and they're all they're all your age. Yeah. I mean, the country's, the, you know, the, the members rely on, on early, particularly early career, early career folks. So, but it's a great experience. The, the danger is you never leave. <laughs> Be careful about that. Yeah. It's, you drink the Kool-Aid and then forget it, right? But, when, you, when, you got, uh, when you mentioned molten salt, I was expecting to hear something about thorium fuel, mm -hmm. and you didn't ever use that word. Does, does that have a future in the plans you're talking about? There, there's a couple. The, the U.S. traditionally has not focused on that, as you well know. Uh, we've been uranium fuel cycle dominated, I would say, uh, for, for reasons that nexus with weapons and other things. Some of, the, some of the companies are talking about, some of the molten salt companies are talking about thorium-based thorium fuels. Um, the DOE is still not doing, the U.S. DOE is still not doing a lot in, in thorium. Uh, we've had a couple companies come to us that are molten salt companies that are thorium based. So we're doing a little bit of work. But it's still this uranium fuel cycle dominance in the US. Now, of course, as you, I think as you probably well know, when you go elsewhere, the, Ind the Indians, for example, have lots of thorium. So they're looking at that from an energy security perspective. Scandinavians are, have, uh, there's a couple companies in Scandinavia. So there's one out in, I in Idaho. Idaho has a lot of thorium, turns out. So there's one in Idaho that speaks to the governor a lot. So I get, I get a lot of calls about thorium from the governor. Yeah. Yes? In the areas of biofuels, given the current administration, we have had to change the language. Mm -hmm. uh, when, for, for, for example, when the proposals from climate change to disaster relief, is, there a, is 
that a similar thing that you have seen when you go up to the hill? I've had to, yeah, t take this the right way, but you have to, yeah, I, I did have to shift the way I talk about it, no, no doubt. I, I, I'm not going to not talk about it because we're, we're impacting the climate. That's the bottom line. Right, I'm a scientist, and I need to, I need to say that. But but but, you heard me. I said reliable, resilient, and clean. Right. So you, you pick up you pick up a. Sh there's been a shift in the message, but I I have not felt any. You didn't ask me this, but just to tell you, I haven't felt pressure. Yeah. Yeah, but when you go to the hill, the climate change conversation was already ha happen happening related to nuclear. So I'm still having it up on the hill. It's, you have to be a little careful, more careful with your message with certain parties in Washington. Yeah. Is, that, is, that, is that diplomatic enough? <laughs> Other questions? Yes, ma'am. Correct. Um, uh, let's see. So I, I'll try to answer. I'll try to answer it, and then tell me if I'm off base. Okay. Uh, if, so 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 it will produce. It'll produce fast neutrons. So it, it, it but it won't just support. It's not viewed as a demo, just to be clear. It's not viewed as a demonstration reactor. It's a test machine. So it's fast neutrons for testing. You name it. We'll have multiple loops inside. Molten salt. We're, we're thinking molten salt loops, high temperature gas loops, as well as liquid metal loops, so that we can do testing. Um, to me. It, 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 allows us to, it allows us to establish capability, build capability that then will sustain to, that, to those future builds. That's my view. I mean, yeah, it's an important test machine, but to me, it's going to employ me, you, and a bunch of people to develop capability. That's what I'm excited about. We haven't built a reactor in too long, right? And the test reactors like Advanced Test Reactor and Hyfer, they're wonderful machines, but, but they're old. So we need to get... It, and I think it picks up momentum. You build it, even if, even if it's a test reactor, if we build it, and it, if we build it paying attention to schedule and budget, that's huge. Because right now nuclear's got a bad name because it, it's always over budget and behind schedule. Does that kind of answer your question? Yes, thank you. Okay, let's thank Mark one more time. Stuff for you. Oh, thank you. Thank you for coming, and uh, I know that your time is extremely busy. So, Lisa, arrange it. Some stuff here. Thank but you, Lisa. The most important thing is this black. Oh, that's terrific. All right, and so let me hand it to you. And this actually, oh, you know, wow. is thank your name you. and the date, and it's a recognition for the distinguished that's speaker. That's cool, huh? Yeah. And it's the state. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Oh, sure. Thank you. Thank you. Lisa. Thanks, Mom. Thank appreciate you. it. That's great. Oh, that means a lot. Thank you. There's some stuff inside. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, I'll set it here.